in our uh, Black History Month um, sp uh, speaker series. Uh, so we're very excited. It's been, you know, really interesting uh, month. Great speakers so far. So we're very pleased to uh, introduce our third speaker for this month. Um, so Dr. Barrington Walker. So uh, Dr. Walker is a professor of history at uh, Wilfrid Laurier University in Waterloo. Um, he's also the inaugural Associate Vice President of Equity, Diversity and Inclusion. Um, he's a specialist in the fields of Black Canadian history, uh, race and the racial state, law and immigration. Um, he is the author of Race on Trial, Black Defendants in Ontario's Criminal Courts. Uh, so very excited to have uh, Dr. Walker join us here today um, and speak to us uh, about um, slavery and emancipation in Canada and hopefully um, you know this is an opportunity for all of us to learn uh, something new and, and important about uh, Black Canadian history. So uh, without further ado I'll, I'll turn it over to you Dr. Walker. Uh, thank you uh, very much for the kind introduction and thank you to all of you who have made time to be on this call um, on a Friday, on a sunny Friday afternoon from where I am. So I'm speaking to you from my home in Kitchener, Ontario, Canada. And uh, I'm, as you've heard, I'm a faculty member and a senior leader at Wilfrid Laurier University in Waterloo, Ontario. My university and its campuses are located on the Haldeman Tract, the traditional territory of the neutral Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples. And this land is part of the one dish, one spoon treaty between the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe peoples and symbolizes the agreement to share protect our resources and not to engage in conflict. From the Haldeman Treaty of October 25th, 1784, this territory is described as, quote, six miles deep from each side of the river, the Grand River, beginning at Lake Erie and extending in the proportion to the head of said river, which them and their posterity are to enjoy forever, end of quote. The treaty was signed by the British and their allies, the Six Nations, after the American Revolution. And despite being the largest reserve demographically in Canada, those nations now reside on less than 5% of this original territory after losing much of the territory to settlement of newcomers. Today, this gathering place is home to many First Nations, Métis, and Indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island. Acknowledging them reminds us of our important connection to this land where we live, learn, and work. So I would also um, today like to thank the organizers of this event um, for Simcoe County and John Merritt uh, in particular, who originally reached out with the invitation to present to you all today. Before I start, I just want to say a little bit about the times uh, that we're living through. Uh, and uh, the ways in which uh, these times uh, continue to shape the ways in which I think about uh, the practice of, of writing Black histories in Canada and thinking about them, lecturing on them, etc. The Black community uh, continues to face many challenges at this time. We have been starkly reminded of these challenges uh, a few years out now uh, from the summer of racial reckoning uh, with the lynching of George Floyd and the disproportionate impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on black people. Uh, neither of these events, uh, neither of these phenomena were the roots of the challenges faced by our communities, of course, uh, but they have shone intense light on them and they have revealed many of the longstanding historical legacies of class, racial and gender inequalities uh, that have long been a part of the black experience in Canada. And the current landscape has also reminded us that we have had long histories as well of resistance and rebellion. I've been asked to come here today to speak about uh, Black history, and I've chosen to share a lecture that I've presented to other groups uh, with some slight modifications on the history of slavery and emancipation in Canada. And these are really uh, two topics, um, slavery and emancipation, two dis somewhat distinct topics, uh, though they overlap in very profound ways. And what do I mean by this? Well, I mean two things by this. We tend to talk about slavery in the singular as if it was only one thing. Uh, it was not. Uh, in the period we are talking about, enslaved peoples lived throughout the Atlantic world. Coerced labor was one of the pillars 
sorry, I'm getting a little feedback there. Okay. Um, coerced labor was one of the pillars of European imperialism and colonialism and capitalism. Uh, slavery changed over time and it had local, uh, regional variations. Uh, Canada uh, was a part of this global imperial system. And even within the upper reaches of Turtle Island, uh, the territory uh, that we now refer to as Canada, there were broad similarities, um, but also um, regional differences. Um, and as well, there were changes over time. The experience of the enslaved also differed uh, because of many factors, uh, gender being an important one of those. And I'll say a little bit more about this later. Emancipation and freedom is also something um, that we uh, typically think about as being um, one thing. And typically when we think about emancipation or the, uh, the end of slavery, um, more specifically it's, its legal end is what we tend to think about. And in some ways, that's exactly what the end of slavery was, the end of legally enforceable um, slavery. But it was also more complicated than that. So what do I mean by this? In what way was it more complicated? Well, emancipation, was emancipation rather something that came from black people or was it decreed from above? And here you get into the debate over whether uh, black people were freed or whether they freed themselves. Additionally, um, after slavery, what did it mean to be free? Was freedom something to be understood as a binary, free versus not free? Or was freedom something to be understood on a spectrum? And 200 years out from the legal end of slavery in the British Empire, are Black people yet free? And how do we measure this? What is the relationship between this past of enslavement and the present? Also, what might our future look like in light of these histories and the present moment uh, in, and through and in, in and through which we are living? And lastly, uh, where might a conversation about reparations factor into these deliberations and conversations? So that's a lot to tackle in the next few um, some odd minutes. Uh, but what I plan to do uh, by way of engaging with these crucial questions is to provide a high level overview uh, of slavery and emancipation. And my hope is that we can use some of these questions as a starting point for a conversation in the Q&A. So let's start then with a few basic historical facts about slavery in Canada. So first for me in thinking about slavery in Canada, geography uh, is very important. Slavery was practiced throughout much of modern day Canada, in New France along the St. Lawrence and the present day maritime provinces. And then after British conquest um, in Upper Canada and Lower Canada, Quebec, Ontario, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick and PEI. And it was practiced in the eras of both French and British colonization. During the years of French colonization from the 17th to the mid 18th centuries, there were a few things that marked the institution. Slavery was integral to the early founding of the colony and the importation of slaves followed accordingly when government officials expressed the need for slaves to Louis XIV who gave the institution legal recognition in the colony. The majority of the enslaved during this time were of indigenous descent or PANI, uh, that's spelled P-A-N-I-S, and a legal, uh, a founding legal document uh, the, called the Code Noir um, that was employed uh, throughout the French empire um, became a guidebook for the treatment of the enslaved and how they would be treated uh, by the law in New France. And the Code Noir had customary application in New France. Um, it was not black letter law uh, in, in New France, but it was as it was throughout the rest of the empire. But again, it served as a kind of guidebook for the relationship between masters and slaves, rights and responsibilities and so forth. Um, 
It featured the penalty of death for slaves who struck their masters or their masters' families. So in that sense, the Code Noir was a harsh document, but it offered um, in the enslavement, uh, the sacrament as well under Roman Catholicism, uh, which was a tacit recognition of their humanity, the enslaved humanity. After the British conquest of New France in 1763, the institution of slavery continues, but it's changed in many respects. And hence, um, this gestures to the importance of the theme of change over time. Uh, the British government uh, ensures slave owners uh, who resided in the former French colony of New France the right to keep their property in enslaved persons. The British Crown also encourages the importation of the enslaved into other British territories. Uh, and following the pattern uh, in the New England uh, colonies and other parts of the British Empire, such as the Caribbean, slavery in Canada gets decidedly uh, quote unquote uh, blacker um, under British rule. Slavery was not legally enshrined in Canada as it was say in Jamaica or South Carolina, but the British did recognize slavery as a property right. I'm gonna talk a little bit now about the lives of enslaved peoples in Canada. Most enslaved people um, had a life similar to those in the New England colonies. Um, so this is a period after um, British conquest. They worked on small farms and had a variety of tasks um, that they performed that were assigned to them by the folks who owned them. And similar uh, to life under the French regime, many worked for the merchant classes, uh, engaged in a number of quote unquote skilled trades. And women had a different experience uh, than did men. Uh, women in particular, and you'll find this uh, is the case throughout the Atlantic world, had the ever present and constant worry about rights to their reproductive labor, sexual violence, and exploitation on the part of the white men who owned them. On um, the question then of the harshness of slavery, and there's a lot of debate in the literature about whether or not slavery in Canada was a harsh institution. Um, the conventional wisdom in Canada, uh, when people have uh, discussed or admitted that the institution in Canada existed at all, is that slavery was less harsh in Canada than the United States and elsewhere uh, in the um, Atlantic world. Uh, so why? Um, because uh, the argument uh, was that there were no large plantations um, here uh, and the sort of uh, slavery that existed in the Caribbean and the, and the U.S. South did not exist in Canada. So going back to slavery in New France, just for a brief second, the fact that slaves could receive the sacrament in New France, as I mentioned earlier, was used by some historians pointed to as evidence that slavery here was less harsh than elsewhere. Um, that may be true, uh, but it was often overlooked by these scholars that it was members of the clergy in New France um, who also owned enslaved people. Uh, and the fact of the matter is that enslaved people in Canada were decidedly unhappy um, with their lot. And I'll say a little bit more about this in the next section. Um, slave owners um, could be very cruel. And this is what the historical record tells us uh, during the New France period and post-conquest. Uh, there are many stories about the ways in which slave owners cruelly mistreated their, their, um, their slaves, uh, and many of them had quite a sadistic streak. And their cruelty challenges uh, the views of those who see the institution as primarily economic and primarily uh, benign, relatively benign in comparison to other parts of the Atlantic world. The enslaved constantly resisted the, condition, the, the conditions of their enslavement. Uh, and there were also um, other things that were intrinsic to slavery in Canada that we rarely think about. And by here, I'm thinking about uh, demographics. Um, and scholars like Frank Mackey and Charlene Nelson have, have um, mentioned this in their work. Unlike other parts of the empire, um, the number of enslaved people uh, were relatively small. Right? So in comparison to the Southern, uh, what's now the United States and the Caribbean, and as a consequence, enslaved people in Canada uh, were hyper visible. And this added to the ability 
of the white population to place them under surveillance. So what I'm gesturing here too is that um, given the demographic reality of slavery in Canada, uh, black skin becomes a kind of prison under these sorts of circumstances. So having talked a little bit about the lives of the enslaved, um, I want to turn now to some of the challenges that enslaved people mounted to slavery. The road to emancipation, um, I argue, and many other scholars have argued, uh, begins with how those who are enslaved rebelled against the institution. And challenges to slavery um, come from both below and above. I can say more about this in the Q&A if people are interested. But the point here is that enslaved people in Canada never passively accepted their fate and found myriad ways to challenge the institution. So examples abound. In the city of Montreal um, during uh, the New France uh, colonial period, Marie-Joseph Angelique, many of you on this call be familiar with her story, uh, was tried and convicted of burning down much of old Montreal. Uh, she was executed in 1734 and is one of the most um, widely accepted interpretations of this crime. And there are a few interpretations of the crime is that she was essentially rebelling against the institution of slavery. Other examples of resistance to slavery were that slaves often ran away from masters. And here you see before you an example of an ad uh, for a runaway slave in uh, Quebec. So this is in the post-conquest period. So these sorts of ads for runaway enslaved men um, and women uh, were relatively common. And slaves, uh, the enslaved people rather in Canada and throughout the Americas also employed other means of uh, resisting, uh, other means of rebelling. Um, for example, things like feigning illness and uh, work slowdowns. And here's a, another um, example um, of, um, well, this is not example of a runaway slave, but a, an, an ad for um, an enslaved person, um, a, a slave um, named Peggy, who was uh, about to be sold by Peter Russell. Um, who I'll say a little bit more about later. Enslaved women also sought to take control of the reproductive labor by aborting pregnancies, um, often with the help of older women who brought African medicinal knowledges uh, with them uh, to farms and plantations um, in North America. And during the American Revolution, uh, between the years of um, uh, in, in the, the, the 1783 um, onwards, there's a large influx of Black people into the region. So between 1783 and 1785, um, there's a large influx. But many arrived there because of their loyalty to the crown during the American Revolution, during this conflict. Some um, had fought uh, for the British. Um, and others um, absconded uh, to British lines, uh, therefore making themselves uh, free. And this was part of uh, British colonial policy uh, during the war to um, encourage military participation uh, from um, enslaved uh, people, people who are enslaved by American colonists, and to uh, translate um, uh, that into uh, into freedom on on uh, in British North America. So these folks made themselves free during the war um, as the British re recognized their loyalty with freedom and land. And many of these folks um, come to be known as the Black Loyalists. And before you on the slide, you see the uh, the Book of Negroes. And I think uh, people on this call will be familiar with this story um, through the work of uh, Lawrence Hill and, and others. Uh, they settled in places like North Preston, uh, Shelburne, and Guysboro in Nova Scotia. And when they arrived in Nova Scotia, uh, they were indeed uh, the largest free Black population at the time. And at the same time, however, um, many white loyalists brought their um, property in enslaved persons with them, and hence slavery with them during the revolution. So what you had then was a large population of enslaved peoples alongside these free Black populations. And what this did was to trouble the relationship between Blackness and enslavement, 
Um, and this is something that was actively encouraged uh, by the free black population who um, helped to um, create opportunities uh, for uh, black people in Nova Scotia, enslaved black people uh, to move into freedom. And there were other things going on during that time, which I can say more about in the Q&A. Uh, the blurring of lines is what um, one of the results of this was, right? And the disappearing of many enslaved peoples into these um, free black communities. So land uh, was at the heart of how um, many of these Black loyalists imagined freedom. Uh, these are folks who had been denied the opportunity to own land in the United States. And when they arrived in Nova Scotia, they found that they had to petition the British for land allotments. Now, when they did get these uh, allotments through this whole culture of petitioning, uh, they found that uh, much of the land that they were um, afforded uh, were on um, smaller and um, small lots, less fertile, um, often um, rocky and stony land. I mean, generally the land was um, quite um, inferior to that uh, land that was received by many white loyalists. And over time, uh, many black loyalists become dispirited and dissatisfied with life in Nova Scotia and many opted to migrate to Sierra Leone, West Africa, in search of more substantive freedom. And you see this happening by about 1793. And once they arrive in Sierra Leone, um, over time and uh, for a time, Black loyalists become one of the most important free Black communities in the Atlantic world with a legacy that endures or that would endure well into the 20th century. Years later, um, another migration of Black people uh, were the product, again, of their loyalty, in a sense, to the British during the War of uh, 1812, uh, the so-called um, Black refugees. Uh, the resistance of enslaved, um, so uh, Moving off of that then, moving off of the Nova Scotia context, I want to talk about a little bit about the resistance of, uh, further talk about the resistance of enslaved Black people to the institution and how this pushed governments to act um, and created a situation where the law would come to play a pivotal role in this story. So this is a long um, and rather complex history. Um, so I'll give a few examples uh, to highlight the role that law and legal institutions played. So for example, um, pushing uh, back a little bit to 1793, uh, there was an enslaved woman by the name of Chloe Cooley, um, who was witnessed being violently sold, sold rather by her owner, Adam Vrooman, for transport across uh, the Niagara River. And this incident um, was reported uh, to the Executive Council of Upper Canada and um, as a result of the, this, this uh, story, which began to get sort of wide traction um, in political circles. And otherwise, Governor John Graves Simcoe shortly took up the cause of abolishing slavery in Upper Canada. Um, but he was confronted by the fact uh, that many of the members of the legislature were themselves slave owners and resisted it, right? So men such as Peter Russell, who I um, mentioned earlier. As a result, um, of this uh, act to limit slavery in Upper Canada was passed in 1793, but it was a gradual emancipation act, right? It did not free a single enslaved person at the time of its passing. And it was in essence, a framework for uh, gradual uh, abolition. The law poses um, other challenges uh, to slavery because in large measure, um, again, uh, these pressures are being placed on the state, on the colonial state by enslaved people. What you find during this era uh, is the courts in British North America and elsewhere begin to slowly extinguish the institution. And the onus is then placed on uh, people who own slaves to prove their claims rather than the other way around. So throughout um, much of the Atlantic world, it is usually um, incumbent upon enslaved people to prove that their 
that they're free, or sorry, it's usually incumbent upon formerly enslaved people to, to prove that they're free by carrying around manumission papers and that sort of thing. Um, the courts in Canada pushed to place the onus on people who own slaves to prove that they indeed lawfully held people in bondage. So what you'll find is in places like Lower Canada and Nova Scotia, legislatures then reject the slave owning classes attempt to legally enshrine the institution. There are some um, exceptions like New Brunswick and PEI, but generally um, you'll find that courts and legislatures uh, move to extinguish the institution of slavery. And enslaved people also have an important role um, to play in this story as well. Uh, they contest their enslavement via freedom suits, um, losing the legal concept of habeas corpus uh, to secure their freedom. And I can say a bit more about this in the Q&A if folks are interested. Slave owners um, try to push back against uh, what they're seeing as the legal and uh, the legislative and judicial tide um, that's chipping away at the foundation uh, by using another legal action um, to try and hang on to their property and slave persons, which is suing for Trover, which is the recovery of um, lost value and wages. And again, I can say more about this in the Q&A. The result of all of this, nonetheless, is that the institution, uh, by the turn of the 19th century in Canada, begins to slowly wither, and this picks up momentum um, throughout the period. So by 1833, 1834, the British um, abolish legal slavery throughout the empire. And, and technically, too, um, this was essentially um, an act of gradual emancipation. Uh, but the institution is formally legally abolished throughout the empire during this time. So the law, in other words, um, by recognizing the right of property ownership and enslaved persons in Canada, was instrumental in propping up the institution of slavery throughout its history in Canada. But over time, it was also used to contest it and to place it into retreat. So the lived experiences of Black people in the era after legally supported slavery in Canada calls into question the meaning of freedom. So think back to some of the questions I posed at the beginning of this lecture. And it poses um, rather difficult questions uh, for historians of Black Canada to consider. Um, the earliest free Black communities in Nova Scotia, for example, and recall I talked about the loyalist and, and refugee um, communities in Canada. Um, they faced discrimination, segregation, and economic marginalization, um, including notably entering into indentured labor agreements that labored slave that mirrored slavery rather in all but name. Black refugees face similar challenges as well. Uh, the abolition of slavery in the British Empire creates the conditions uh, for the Underground Railroad, uh, the legal frontier of freedom that exists in that existed in Canada. Uh, but this was only made possible because slavery was widely practiced and abolished in Canada. So after 1834, a large influx of enslaved Black people uh, from the U.S. make their way to Canada. Um, and perhaps this is the most well-known chapter of Black Canadian history. Um, and they settle in many parts of Canada, um, Canada West, uh, Nova Scotia, uh, New Brunswick, and the Canadian West, particularly in the 1880s. Um, you see them in places in the Canadian West, like Amber Valley, these old kind of historic uh, turn of the 20th century uh, Black communities. And these are people who lived uh, in between legal freedom and equality before the law and pervasive. Pa and, and, and Let me say that again. Sorry. So these are Black people who lived in between legal freedom and equality before the law and pervasive patterns of discrimination. And uh, this era is what I and others have called um, Canadian Jim Crowism. And, you know, many scholars um, have uh, talked about this period um, where people of African descent live this kind of tension and this kind of contradiction uh, between um, legally um, legal freedom, so freedom on paper, legal equality, citizenship rights, and the reality of segregated schools, 
uh, residences and pervasive um, forms of societal discrimination, as well as unequal treatment in the criminal justice system and racist and exclusionary um, immigration laws. And on this slide in front of you, you'll see two examples of um, this era in Canadian history, um, both of which are becoming increasingly well known. You'll recognize on the left uh, the picture of Viola Desmond, um, who now adorns our um, $10 bill, um, at least the ones that, the, besides the ones that still um, feature John A. McDonald. Um, and you all know her story about um, fighting for um, civil rights and, and, um, and equal accommodation in the province of Nova Scotia. And on the right, uh, you see the historic community of Africville, uh, which is a community that existed in the Bedford Basin in um, Nova Scotia. Um, that is um, kind of emerged, it's kind of the textbook um, example of, um, of spatial um, um, anti-Black racism um, and anti-Black environmental racism in Canada. And it was a, a community that looked like it was um, in distress um, and a derelict community to outsiders um, that actually was quite a vibrant community that was raised in the 1960s um, awash uh, a wave of concern about urban renewal um, in the Canadian context. So um, in the time that I have left, I want to say a little bit, um, keeping with this theme of um, the in-between space that um, Black people lived in between slavery and freedom by taking a Bit of a, a little bit of a deeper dive into uh, the area where most of you are joining me from, and that's Simcoe County. Um, and then I want to loop back to some of the questions that I started the lecture uh, with and then open it up to um, Q&A. So I just want to say a few words, um, given um, who's hosting this talk about the Simcoe County Black experience um, and Oro um, Township um, in particular. And I want to offer some thoughts with regard to uh, Black settlement um, and its relationship to settler colonialism, because I don't want to lose sight of that connection between Black settlement and settler colonialism in Canada. So the first wave of Black settlement to the area was between the years of uh, 1819 and 1826. Um, and this settlement, uh, this wave of settlement was sponsored uh, by the upper Canadian government uh, the only uh, Black settlement that had this sort of direct government involvement. And others were sponsored by private philanthropic groups or by um, by Black people themselves. Uh, the community was built as a result of these efforts and, of course, the efforts of settlers um, and um, a vibrant uh, community um, emerged at the center of which uh, um, the t at the center of Oro was a Methodist Episcopal church, which stood at the center of this important community. Many of these settlers were veterans of the War of 1812, and uh, the government um, gave them land allotments um, as a uh, in, in reward of their service um, to the crown. So you see this sort of theme developing out of the, the American Revolution, the Wars of 1812. Oro Township um, was um, also a part of a larger history of Upper Canadian land grants. Um, and I've argued in my most recent work that we cannot and we must not understand Black settlers and Black settlement outside of the framework of settler colonialism and the dispossession of Indigenous people. Traditional histories of the region um, and Upper Canada more broadly uh, frame this period of settlement in the context of quote unquote free land um, and land grants, um, but very rarely do they directly confront the conversation. I hope this is changing, I suspect it is, around uh, from whence these lands came, right? So there are ideas of terra nullis or empty lands um, concept of settlement that tends to um, predominate in discussions about Black settlement in areas across um, Upper Canada, indeed across the country. So the land upon which Black people settled um, was the original territory of several Indigenous nations, the Huron-Wendat, uh, the Anishinaabe, the, the Pitun, the Neutral, and the Haudenosaunee. And the pre-Confederation um, Upper Canadian government treaties that facilitated Indigenous dispossession were several. There was the Penetanguishing Treaty No. 5, uh, the Simcoe Treaty No. 16, and uh, in a later period, the post-Confederation Williams Treaties of 1923. 
Um, there's a second wave of black settlement to oral that occurs between the years of 1828 and 1831. Um, and black settlement into the area was triggered by the black codes in Ohio. So this um, this attempt uh, to control free black populations in the northern United States, um, and that is also an important, uh, more broadly part of the story of black migration into Canada. Although it's usually framed as an escape from slavery, there's this going on as well in Canada. Um, and there are a couple of other examples that one could point to. What happened during this time is that the government was selling um, these settlers' lands for a shilling per acre. Over time, um, as you know, the settlement declined. And by 1831, uh, the decision was made uh, to open up Oro to white settlement. And the County of Simcoe website uh, claims that this influx of white settlers uh, drove up the price of land, um, and thus many black settlers um, in this heavily black agricultural settlement sold their land. Um, and the question that I um, have about this, and the question I've always had, uh, is why black settlers in Oro um, and in the region of Simcoe would have sold a rapidly appreciating asset when they had already owned these owned these lands. Um, indeed, Robin Wings tells us that some of the black um, settlers were quote unquote um, squatters, but indeed it's also true that particularly those who would engage in military service um, had large swaths of land that were granted to them for free or at very minimal cost. Um, so one wonders then, I wonder what may have been at work in the decision um, that black families uh, made en masse to sell uh, their land. Uh, what we do know um, is that by the 1830s, uh, white racial attitudes in Upper Canada um, had begun to harden with the growing influx of Black people into the province. And I wonder um, what role uh, this hardening of attitudes may have had uh, in the decision of Black people to leave this area. So, in conclusion, uh, the histories of slavery and freedom in Canada are complex. Um, too much so for a short presentation. I know that this presentation has covered lots of ground. Slavery was widely practiced in Canada. Um, it was a brutal institution that was always resisted by the enslaved. The abolition of slavery is often viewed um, as a result of the winds of change that blew through the Atlantic world. That's one of the kind of the dominant interpretations of emancipation. Um, particularly as a consequence of the spirit of the age of revolution, the period between the American Revolutionary War um, to the French revolutions and Haitian revolutions. And this was certainly a factor. But most importantly, what I've tried to impart during this brief lecture, um, most uh, just as important was the, re the legacy of the resistance of those who were enslaved. Um, lastly, um, slavery and freedom have uh, left us a complex legacy. Slavery has been abolished, certainly, um, but as theorist and scholar Sidia Hartman reminds us, um, we live in the afterlife of slavery. Indeed, a recent collection by the founders of the Black Lives Matter movement in Canada is aptly titled Until We Are Free. And this is a work that was published just a few years ago. In short, uh, legal emancipation and freedom um, may well be two different matters. Black people in Canada are no longer in the grip of legally supported slavery, but our freedom, however, uh, may well be quite a different matter. So I'm going to end um, with the questions with which I started. So first, what did it mean to be free? Did emancipation live up to its promise for formerly enslaved people, whether they had been enslaved in Canada or the United States? Did Black people um, ever manage to escape the stigma of being racialized as Black, um, a history that is bound up with the institution of slavery? Was freedom something to be understood as a binary, free or not free? Or was freedom um, something that existed on a spectrum? In other words, um, what is the difference? Um, what is the 
substantive difference between forms of indentured servitude and class exploitation and the institution of slavery. What is the relationship between the past and the present? What might our future look like in light of these histories and present and the present moment? Uh, where might reparations factor into these conversations, if at all? Thank you very much. I will end it there and open it up to any questions that folks might have. Great. Thank you, Dr. Walker. That's really interesting. I know it's a lot of ground to cover in a short period of time. Um, and uh, yeah, no, I, I appreciate you. You covered a lot of ground for us. And it's it, I think it's um it, it's it seems really uh you know a, a lot of opportunities like this we tell stories that are kind of like a little more uh like make us feel kind of better as a country about our relationship with with black people and it's nice you know i think it's good it's good to hear um kind of l less positive more critical and to, to think more critically about our history in that way so yeah i appreciate it um so I have one question here. Matthew, you have your hand up. Um, I'm going to, you think you can take yourself off mute? You want to give that a try? Yeah, I can take myself off mute. Just awesome. didn't want to interrupt you. Mm. Yeah, go for it. Um, so uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Walker, for the presentation. I apologize. I was a few minutes late there. Kind of lost okay. track of time. <laughs> no problem. Um, so. Uh, my understanding of black history is not strong, so it was very interesting to kind of get a brief overview of some of the stuff in Canada. I'm actually coming from London, Ontario. Um, we have recently brought in a building to our Pioneer Village. Uh, it's the, uh, it was the original uh, AME church that was mm -hmm. built here in London, and mm -hmm. uh, we're currently trying to expand our knowledge on black history because it was something we didn't really cover. And now we're actually trying to be fully involved in black history. And I found it very interesting that I didn't know that there were suits that were coming, uh, legal suits that were before uh, abolition. I knew there was a uh, protest and I knew that there was uh, challenges to, to the institution of slavery. Uh, but I guess my question I had was uh, prior to uh, emancipation in 1834 by by the British, what was the attitude towards slavery or like in Canada uh, prior to that was because it was starting to kind of like it sounded like it was maybe starting to uh, ebb away from slavery or seen as very yeah. American kind of thing after mm -hmm. War of 1812. Yeah, so it's a it's a <laughs> it, that is a complex question, uh, multifaceted. <laughs> I, I figured it no, and and I, I'll. I will attempt yeah. to answer it. I mean, and I also want to comment on the sort of the pioneer village thing. Um, mm -hmm. Although you didn't ask me to comment on that. One of the things that I would like to see mm -hmm. is that whole discourse of the pioneer um, being reframed um, to talk more in terms of settler colonialism. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, and and for the, the place of black settlers within that story about dispossession of indigenous land, and settler colonialism. So not to say that these black settlers and and the the AME Church were the architects of you know the the, the numbered treaties in in Upper Canada um, or the Indian Act or any of those things, but there is there, there there's a need to situate analytically theoretically um, folks in this story and and get rid of the innocent and somewhat romantic notion of the pioneer, um, which I think is very um, dangerous actually um, and. I'm sure maybe that what I've said is going to anger some people on the call, but I, I really do feel like it's time for us to to get away from that. Um, so we have discussed like side we as a side note, we have discussed yeah. as it is. We've have had some negative aspect of it. We've had some people who've resisted it. We yeah. And you will we are yeah. exploring options to see what, yes. what's our best option here. OK, um, so in terms of the attitude towards slavery, um, it, you know, again, you, you have many legal elites um, who are part of this uh, this transatlantic uh, story of, um, you know, whatever some some historians sort of 
poetically call it, you know, the winds of change blowing through the Atlantic world. Um, and, uh, you know, there are some, there are certain philosophical currents um, that are inspiring uh, a, a group of jurists, uh, judges um, in some provinces to kind of push back against it again, put the onus on the slave um, holding class. Um, you also have slave owners in places like um, Nova Scotia um, who arrive um, in the late uh, 18th century and um kind of figure out you know they come at a time of of and this isn't my work this is the work of james uh, walker um, um amani whitfield and others um, who are experts in this area they arrive at a, a time when um there's there, there's quite stark economic hardship in nova scotia um and later on new brunswick and this is one of the the, the most pivotal scenes that you'll see in the i'd encourage people to watch the book of negroes the cbc documentary um so a lot of slave owners just decide that um, it's not in their economic interest to keep people enslaved so you have those who are fighting to keep their property enslaved persons and those who are actually willing to to send to, to set people free essentially um, and realize that it's quote unquote cheaper to have them in to have them as lowly uh, paid wage laborers or to involve them in um indentured servitude. And the really sad story is people who actually win their freedom and then get uh, get sucked back into arrangements that look like indentured, uh, that are essentially indentured servitude. So it really does trouble that notion of slavery being this binary, that you're free or not free. Uh, it, you know, I guess I pose it as a question, but we might want to think about the ways in which it's it's more of a continuum. So there's there are lots of contests going um, on. I think the basic point that I'd like people to be aware of is that slavery was practiced in Canada. Um, there was a sizable slave owning class. And for a large part of our history, the law did support the institution of slavery through the right of 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 um, of um, protecting um, property ownership. So in general, um, it was a culture that, um, although there were these emancipatory currents, it was a culture that did support the enslavement of African people. So this mythology that we all have that, um, you know, somehow this was an unequivocal refuge from slavery and from white supremacy is just, it's simply not, um, it's not true. It's what we teach our kids. All of my students, when I ask them at the beginning of my classes, what do you know about Black history in Canada? They all know about the Underground Railroad. Um, they all know about the idea of slavery being a haven from uh, Canada being a haven from slavery. Um, they don't know about the bits before. Uh, they don't know that in early earlier parts of our history, um, as Harvey and Manny Whitfield has told us, that there are actually slaves uh, during the American Revolution, slave people going south uh, because in the New England territories, um, you had emancipation while you had slavery in what's now currently Canada, right? So there was an underground railroad going south, and we just we. We're so invested in this mythology that uh, that this was a haven that, you know, it's it sort of borders on propaganda, what we teach students in school. OK, thank you. Mm -hmm. Welcome. Thanks. Andy. So uh, we have another hand up, but there's a this, there's a question that came in in the chat uh, first. So I just wanted to speak to that first. So um, Ruth is asking if anybody knows where the black settlers who left Oro went was a new community established elsewhere. Um, uh, I will say, Ruth, I'm going to plug our next speaker. <laughs> so on the 27th, we have Janie Cooper Wilson, who's probably the best person you could ask that question to. So she's a descendant of some of the people from that community. She's an expert. She's been studying this story for years and years and years. And obviously, you know, as you can imagine, is personally invested in it. Um, and so she'll be speaking. Uh, as she'll be the, our last speaker in the series on on Monday, the twenty seventh, um, from two to three in the afternoon. That would be a good if you're able to make it. If you, that would be a good time to to ask her. Um, I, I know I've you know there's a lot of questions about about a kind of uh, what happened to that community and where people went and why they left and things like that. And Dr. Walker spoke to that a little bit. Um, but I think, yeah, you. I know the few people that I know of from that community. You know, you find them kind of all over the place, whether you know, back in the United States or um, in Western Canada, uh, Collingwood and Janie's ancestors. I think That's right. they lived um, in uh, what's now, uh, I think it's Clearview. So it was uh, Sunnydale Township around New Lowell. Um, there's a community that Janie 
uh, is kind of involved in kind of studying and preserving all the silver shoe. Um, yeah, so uh, and then yeah, Collingwood as well. So uh, yeah, definitely that's the little I know, but Janie, she'd be able to tell you a lot more. So if you're able to, I would tune in on Monday. Thanks, John. Yeah, thank you. I will, I will, I will, I will defer to your next speaker on that. <laughs> I, I kind of jumped to conclusions there that I would just refer to Jeannie, but yeah. <laughs> um, so Megan Crawford, you've had your hand up for a while there. Um, I appreciate your patience. What's your question? Hello, are you able to hear me okay? I am, yep. Great. Um, hi, Dr. Walker. I actually took a course with you oh, about, uh, I don't know, 10 or so years ago when I was doing my master's at Queen's, so it's nice to... Oh, wonderful, nice to hear from you again. Yeah, it was, um, it, to this day, it uh, remains one of the most uh, powerful and informational and educational courses that I took. And I was one of the students who said, I know about the Underground Railroad, um, <laughs> when you asked us what we knew about the history of Black Canadians. Uh, the question that I have for you, Dr. Walker, um, was about your um, the comment that you made about that um, enslaved people were offered the sacrament. And I was wondering if another way that it can be viewed, and it, maybe it is viewed in the historical community, was was that maybe a way to, a desire to try to, quote, civilize, unquote, enslaved people, similar to how religion was used with Indigenous peoples? You know, that's a really great question. I have to take that away and think about it, because it doesn't come up that way in the... Um, in the literature and I think uh, without going down a rabbit hole I think it's because there are longer there are there are there are older conversations going on in the Atlantic world about the, pro the proximity of various groups to humanness which is which means you know people of European descent um, and I think generally those that sort of argument has been framed with regard to um, it, with regard to thinking about Indigenous peoples as having sort of more um, a proximity to what it means to be human and then um, sort of taking that and then saying, well, you know, uh, the sacrament was a tacit recognition of, um, of Black humanity because if there was no conception of Blacks being human and certainly not fully human, then this wouldn't have even, even entered into the, the minds of the people who are proselytizing them. Um, but I think that you are right. It's also part of the broader um, history of colonization, part of that shared um, uh, history of, um, of colonization shared by both, not in the same way as Black people and Indigenous people. So I think, I mean, I do think there's much to what you are, to what you are saying um, and something that I'm, I'm going to think about, I think, um, the next time I give this lecture or, or, or a similar lecture. So thank you for that. So that's something I'm going to take away and think about. Thank you, Dr. Walker. And I, I didn't mean to suggest it in a way about a way for you to edit your presentation. I was just wondering if there was an aspect of that. No, I think there is. Um, uh, so I, yeah, uh, the, the, the reason I'm excited about it is because I haven't seen, um, I haven't seen that line of interpretive thought anywhere. So thank you. Thank you. All right, thanks for your question. Does anybody else have any questions for Dr. Walker before we let him go? I wonder, Dr. Walker, did you did you have any final thoughts, anything that you wanted to, any questions you wanted to ask us or anything that you wanted to leave us with? We have a few minutes left. Uh, <laughs> And just the, the 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 irresponsible questions that I raised at the end of my presentation about why these folks left. Um, I would be really interested for folks um, as a group, as this group, to sort of and and what your next speaker has to say about that. So you know the where where people ended up, I think is is an important question. Um, from whence they came is an important question. The nature of the settlement. Um, so the, the irresponsible part of it is I don't have any evidence for why people left and that's, that's the, the and I don't think the archives are, are going to tell us, but I, I find it, um, and maybe I said this to you years ago, John, um, 
if I owned a piece of property that was rapidly appreciating in value because of an influx of settlement, I don't know that my first inclination would be to sell it. Um, my inclination might be to hang on to it or try to leverage it to buy more land. Um, that has never quite added up to me about this whole story. And I think it speaks to, I think, I think um, some of the answers, uh, potential answers around that are deeply unsettling. Um, and, and also the, the kind of invisibilization of Black agricultural settlement across Ontario, right? When, so when you read 19th century accounts of Black life in Ontario, they're mainly talking about agricultural settlement in Upper Canada. Um, same with uh, same in the Nova Scotian context. And what happens to all of these people, right? To the point now where when people, when you think of um, agricultural settlement in the province of Ontario, um, you don't you don't think about people of African descent or, or indigenous people for that matter. So, um, you know, why? And, and, and how did that happen? Um, and, and how did a group of people decide en masse to, to sell land? Um, I mean, granted, that was appropriated from indigenous people, but to sell land that they got for free or for a shilling an acre um, and decided to sell it um, at the height of its value to, to white settlers. Um, you know, and there are similar stories that people are asking um, about the disappearance of African Americans from agricultural land in the American South, right? Um, right? Huge transfers, transfers of land um, took place in the era after slavery um, in the U.S. And usually the story is framed that Black Americans went north in search of greater opportunities, or it was the bull weevil or something. There's always some story about why people left uh, and, and went to work in the factories of the north. But some of the uh, the, the, the things around um, violence and racial terror um, that surely played a role in people leaving, we don't we don't talk about. So, you know, I'm just curious to to know um, what you will all come up with as a historical um, society um, around this. What 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 are the sorts of things that the the archives can tell us about this? There was a comment there. Oh yeah. What was that so uh, there is two. So Janice was saying thank you and for uh, for the presentation and for uh, your questions for us to think about. And I think you know it, it's great. We have a few days. We have the weekend, and we can come back on Monday and hopefully explore this a little bit more with with Janie. Um, and Ellen uh, is asking. Um, or no, her comment was that uh, there is probably lots of reasons why people left Oro, but she just uh, made an observation that a lot of the land that was assigned um, to the Black veterans, so kind of the er early wave of settlers mm -hmm. who arrived, who mm -hmm. were, you know, they were specifically allotted land um, by the land council. Um, uh, it's pretty swampy, that was her comment, this is kind of marginal land. Um, and this was a you know a concession that was smaller than the land that was granted to white settlers at this the, basically the exact same time so April 8, 1819 um, there was a, a concession of one of 200 acre lots and then this concession concession the front the fronts were measured by an old system and then the rest of the lot was measured by a newer system so it was a different size mm -hmm. and that was the concession that was initially those are all the lots that were granted to black settlers as they were kind of petitioning for land mm -hmm. um so you know it's it's remote um maybe the lands you know as ellen pointed out it's marginal and um and it's a smaller size than what was given to these white settlers many of whom were quite successful right they became pretty successful because they they were right on a main road and they had better land bigger lots um right. so it's yeah there is a lot there's a lot going on there right and and that's another story that you know there's versions of it that are a little more like and congratulatory to um kind of uh the government and society um uh, but there's probably, you know, there's there's a lot of room for critical thinking there too, right? So I'm glad you raised some of those questions too. And um, I'm looking forward to talking more about this uh, on Monday. And thank you for sharing that nuance about the um, 
the unequal land allotments, which is also a pattern you see throughout British land policy where black people are. Concerned. Yeah, and I know. So yeah, I was thinking of, yeah. yeah, I was thinking Same of that because you mentioned that in yeah, in Nova yeah. Scotia. Yeah. So we have one question from Anne. If you have a if if you have sure. a few minutes for her, yeah. Okay. So go ahead. Sure, Anne. I can take one more. Can you take yourself off mute, Anne? Hi. Hi. I'm Hi. I'm wondering what what the educational role it was of governments for blacks uh, because in my humble opinion um, education is the way to um, uh, freedom. Uh, freedom. Uh, freedom. Uh, freedom. Um. So, Ms. Harrison, that's again. Sorry, there's some feedback, so I'll I'll be quick. Um, there's a there's a long, um, complex history of uh, the education of Black people. Um, so you're quite right. A lot of Black people looked at education as the uh, the key to freedom. Black people were denied, particularly in the United States. We don't know as much about the Canadian context, the right to literacy, and all these things. And yeah, you're right. Um, education is the key to um, full political equality, civic equality economic mobility, all of those things. And blacks, Black people did uh, seek those things out. Um, the story in um, Upper Canada, Ontario, is that uh, Black people during this period face a great deal of um, opposition from white families when they try to bring their children to common schools. Um, and the way that the Common Schools Act of 1840, 40-something, 40 is interpreted um, is for... Uh, you know, basically it allows um, groups of a certain number to be able to petition for their own schools. A lot of white settlers um, use that provision then to force uh, black people out of the common schools and to open up their own schools, um, which are vastly um, inferior. So there are some stories of, um, of successfully integrated schools. Um, there are some stories of private schools in places like Buxton, for example, um, where the it was a school that was opened um, by a, a free black community where the education was demonstrably superior to that of the common school. And you'll see like little white kids um, in the Buxton uh, Mission School because it was because it was actually a better school. Uh, so it was not sort of uniformly um, sort of a color line, uh, but the uh, particularly as the 19th century grinds on racial attitudes harden. The general pattern is that white parents don't want their kids going to school with black children. And you find that pattern particularly um, so in southwestern Ontario, right, where you see the largest influx of the Black community in places like um, um, Kent and Essex County, um, Middlesex, you see that quite quite starkly. I don't know as much um, about the, the education scene, admittedly, in, uh, in, in Simcoe County. Maybe your next speaker can speak to that. Um, but yeah, that's that's the general um, story. In some ways, it shares um, similarities to uh, Black people's desire for education across North America. In some ways, there are things that are um, that are unique to the story. But there are segregated schools in Ontario until the 1960s, right? All right. Thanks for your question, Anne, and thanks for your time, uh, Dr. Walker. Um, just a few thank yous coming in as well in the chat. So um, thank you, everybody. Yeah. So Ellen and and uh, Matt are both saying thanks for your time thank you. um, and your presentation. So yeah, no, I, I appreciate it. Uh, a lot to think about, um, but I think it's a good occasion to kind of take the time to think critically about these stories. It's good to tell the stories. It's good to know them. Um, but there's still a lot still a lot to learn, right? And a lot to think about. So um, yeah, I appreciate your time. Um, thank you, everybody. So, yeah, thanks again. So um, thanks for joining us, everyone, as well. So um, be sure to to come back same time, same place on Monday, uh, the 27th, for uh, Jeannie Cooper-Wilson. So again, extremely knowledgeable um, member of the uh, local Black community here. So her ancestors lived. Um, in Oro, um, and uh, she's, you know, grown up her whole life in Simcoe County, and she's, you know, um, made it kind of her life's work to tell the story of 
her family and her community um, and historical communities all across Ontario. So she has a lot uh, to share with us. So it's definitely worth um, coming to hear her speak as well next week. So hope to see you all there. Um, in the meantime, have a great weekend, everybody. Thanks again for joining us um, and uh, take care. Talk to you soon. Okay. Take care. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Bye.